All righty, so um, we're continuing our study. The name of the course is Law and Grace, but we have found that the, the true contrast that God uh, has for us is in relationship to the law and the lamb. And um, you see this in many ways. You see this in, in, um, in the instance of, uh, for example, the Ten Commandments. Most of them are, the, are, are thou shalt not. And the two, I think there's only one more after that, but anyway, the, the two main ones that started off with thou shalt love um, fulfill everything else. Doing something that is, as it were, uh, well, that's by the spirit of the Lamb. And uh, so uh, we got into the Beatitudes. We got into some things before that, and then we got into the Beatitudes. And then we started going through the uh, Sermon on the Mount after that. And we covered quite a bit of ground, actually. But uh, tonight, um, and maybe onward, we'll see, uh, I think that there's a possibility that I am going to be cut short. I, I could be gone next week. Is that? Yeah, yeah I, I will be gone next week. All right. So, I don't know, she'll tell you, she'll tell you at halftime she's been sick and she's I ask her, how many fingers am I holding up? And she can't tell me, and it's, I don't know what's wrong. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like for us to, to go through some of the stories or examples or um, parables or however you want to put it um, that are more aligned with um, real-life situations. And I want us to see, again, this contrast of law and land. And um, and then, as I was saying, is is that um, the law primarily is about what you shouldn't do, but the lamb is primarily about what what you should do by his nature, and it's usually positive for others, <laughs> not necessarily positive for you, like the cross, for example. It wasn't so positive for Jesus, and yet. It was, uh, it was his heart and his privilege to do that, to give himself for others. So anyway, I'd like to start in uh, Matthew chapter 10. And uh, just to look at one verse here and try to really contemplate and then comprehend this contrast between law and lamb uh, in relationship to it. This is Matthew 10. Um, and you don't want to keep your place there uh, if you got something to mark that with, which I do, yes. But I've also got another verse jotted down here that I forgot about. And it's over in Matthew 25. Um, Okay, yeah, save the Matthew 25. Maybe you should mark that one and go back to Matthew 10. All right. <clears throat> Matthew 10, 42. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise or no way lose his reward. All right, so we tend to look at great acts, and those great acts are the things that should be honored. Um, we do that because um, the, the law particularly does that. But you know, the lamb, even the smallest act that's done in his nature, that's done by his selflessness, that's done putting others first, is considered to him a great act. He, and, and I wrote, Jesus is different. He delighted over one cup of water 
that is given in this selfless, loving spirit. And what a huge contrast between the law and the Lamb. What a huge contrast is this because uh, it's even a contrast between, the Lamb is a contrast, sadly, but between, you know, a certain degree of Christianity that is, that is focused on great ministries and big churches and uh, big events and, um, and, and individually it, um, it fosters in people um, that you, you, you know, you can do it. You can, you can do great things for God and this sort of thing. And um, I'm not against doing great things for God. I'm talking about a mindset that could be formulated from the law where we're trying to earn something with God based on works as opposed to something that comes by nature and life by the Lamb of God himself, something that flows into us and through us and is maybe never noticed, maybe our whole life, never really noticed by anybody. Never, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but when I first got saved, I really thought, wait a minute, excuse me. What is this? <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I had, maybe you could call them visions of grandeur. Maybe you could call them visions of great things for God. Maybe they're the same thing. <laughs> and my vision, you know, I mean, when I got saved, I ended up hearing from a friend that I should go to this, this church and uh, a very famous um, televangelist was there before he became very famous and and uh, and he was going around and miracles were happening and stuff and and even the Lord was doing that I mean this was at a time where the Lord was moving powerfully in those ways and you know I just I just kept thinking I am one day going to become a great evangelist and I'll be honest with you now, what I had in my mind had something to do with like a, a Cadillac and <laughs> a big house and a lot of people that wanted to listen to me and that, that I would have a, a name that would be known and loved and respected. And, uh, and you know, the Lord, we, sometimes we formulate these ideas and we formulate them not just from a... Christian culture, but from a, a selfish desire within ourselves to become something. Even if it's for Jesus, I want to become something. And as I was reading that scripture and praying and meditating and trying to, to hear from the Holy Spirit this true contrast, um, that's, that's what he said. He said, you know, we esteem great acts and great things that we've done as something noble. And he's trying to communicate that even the smallest thing delights him if it's done in the right spirit. Even the smallest, how small can you get? You know, and, and there it is. Anyway. Um, Except it doesn't have to do not only with water, but every deed that can come from him. Every deed that can flow out from him. And um, uh, let's see, I, I, I put something else down here. Oh yeah, to him it is greater, those, those selfless acts to him it is greater than many great deeds done to gain notice, to gain honor, to gain respect, etc. You know, I mean, should we be doing that anyway? I mean, no. If people honor us, it should be because of something that the Lord put in their heart. And, you know, I mean, the Lord has his, his way of doing things. You know, he has his way of doing things. He has a way of taking away all the people that honored you for wrong purposes. 
so that the only people surrounding you would be people who honor you because it's the Lord. Is that so bad? Well, it is if, if it's only three people, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's what we think, but it's not bad at all, even if it's three people or two people, you know? And so, um, so that, I started meditating on that spirit, and that's where I went over to uh, Matthew 25. And you've heard me share some things on this before, but um, I, want, I want to bring out some, maybe some new things here. This is uh, Matthew 25, is that what I said? No. 25:32, and we'll read down to 40. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. Hmm. You gave me drink. And I was a stranger, and you took me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. And I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed? Or when saw we thee sick, in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Okay, so um, the first thing to note, which we've discussed before when we look at these scriptures, is that when Jesus sees things, he sees them in terms of nature. He sees them as sheep that are after his kind or goats that are not after his kind okay and this is since this is the all the nations this is universal this is clearly uh, there are no traits in one nation or one society or one kind of people that fit this it is this this one who is doing the dividing is the shepherd, but this shepherd is different. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Why? What makes you so good? I give my life for them. I give my life for the sheep. It's a spirit. It's a, it's, he's guiding them with that spirit. That's, the, that's part of the key is to see into reality as God sees it, to see that that's a lamb sitting on that throne and he divides them as a sheep, uh, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And this is how he sees. He sees according to nature, not just all the deeds. And in fact, and I didn't look it up, but in fact, in, um, in the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, the judgment and everything. And every man shall be judged according to his works of what sort they are. Think of that in relationship to this, of what sort they are. Are they goat works or are they lamb works? Are they sheep? And so um, um, as I was thinking about, <laughs> thinking about it, and I, I, there was a, a show that had something like this in it, but it was, uh, that we're either learned goats or altered sheep. And when I say altered, I don't mean we're changed. I mean we've been to the altar. We're altered sheep. And I, I talked about that in uh, Ireland, one of the sessions, how, how Isaac 
became from being the, the glorious, blessed, loved son to the altered son. Take now thy son, whom thou lovest. See, and, and all hopes and all glory was being placed on that son. And in fact, God was waiting for the altered son, for that son to be taken up on Moriah, lay it on the altar. And then from then on, Abraham would no longer relate. It's the same, you say it's the same son. It is, but it isn't. This one now has gone to the altar. This one now has laid down his life. This one now has shown that he's a sheep. Um, and um, so from now on, Abraham's whole relationship with the son has to be different. Different. Has to be based on the altar. And has to know him after the altar. And from then on, this is... This is where that is fulfilled. Uh, I think it says that in the book of James. Um, that in Genesis 15, it said, it talked about uh, this, your faith is counted to you for righteousness. But here's where it is, your faith is fulfilled. This is where, at the altar, is where it's going to really count. This is the difference. One is a belief system and the other is the belief system is more than a belief system. It becomes a nature, and it becomes proceeding as he proceeds in that spirit and in that nature. So uh, I wrote at the judgment, we look for Jesus to honor our great acts and deeds. And that's what, imagine all the nations being there, and okay, well, I, you know, I'm, they're thinking, well, thank God I did this, and I did this, and I hope he doesn't bring this up, or that, but, you know, we're thinking of all the things that can get us across, that can get us over. And we're not thinking of what sort they are. We're just thinking, you know. And um, so at the judgment, we look to Jesus to, uh, for Jesus to honor our great acts and deeds. But Jesus is different because his eyes are different. And this is in the Re book of Revelation, chapter 5, where he's full of eyes. And we see with two eyes, in fact, I don't know if I said something there. Um, but but, but he, sees, he sees things from all kind of angles. And he sees more into things than we see into. We tend to see surface things. Um, he is a lamb that has many eyes so that he not only sees the great things, but even the most minute acts at the my, most minute acts and attitudes and thoughts. He sees things that those with human two eyes would miss because that's what he's looking for. He's looking, see, if this is a lamb on the throne, then he's looking for those that are after his kind. See. Now, is it possible, and you, you tell me, is it possible that we couldn't figure out that he's looking for acts that look, look similar to this, this lamb here. And so we set about to do those, but they're not actually like the picture. You remember Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And he talked about fountains of living water and, and this flow out of us, you know. and. Uh, and we get saved and we go, well, where's the flow, you know, and where's the, you know, where's it flowing like that? Well, the explanation comes at the end in the book of Revelation as the new Jerusalem is declared to be the wife of the lamb. The wife of the lamb, that's what it calls her, the bride, the wife of the lamb. Transparent gold, the lamb is seated on the throne. He's a slain lamb. And out of the lamb in the throne flows that, but it flows out of her too, and it goes to the nations. See, because it's flowing out of him who's inside of her. So there's the, the true fulfillment of that is crucified lamb that has been honored by God has a flow of life, the rivers, river of life that flows and that river that flows from him through us is what brings healing to the nations. We just go, well, it's healing waters. No, it's not just healing waters. It's, it's him. 
It's the, it's the touch of him. And that's, you know, even the healing that he did was his touch. It wasn't just like a, a magician who would do something. It was an outflow from him. The, the uh, widow with the, the, not the widow, but the woman with the issue of blood. She touched him and virtue went out of him into her. It was something different than healing. It was, it was what's in him touching that. So that's what you see in the book of Revelation. You see, and you see the fulfillment of what he means by rivers of living water. It's going to be a flow of life. And it's the river of life. It's called the river of life, you know. And it's going to flow through them. So, uh, or, or not. Um, what is the dividing point in his heart that causes his choices? It is how we view and then treat others. Okay, now this is important because we think the lamb's just going to be in me somehow because I'm a Christian and because I'm getting a, a lot of good teaching on this or something. And we think that anything that we do therefore, is going to be that, and especially anything that we do good for others. This is what we think. But there's something, there's, there's something that has to happen in us. It's not just like we're a, 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 a conduit in the sense of just a pipe, and, and it just flows through us and touches them, see. There's more to it. And the proof of that is that it's flowing out of New Jerusalem, not just out of individual Christians. It's flowing out of what's transparent gold. It's flowing out of what, what has the attributes of him. Uh, but more than that, it is also him in there. But she has begun to conform because she's, she's after his kind. She's the one. And that, that she represents all of us, the body of Christ, conformed in heart when the heart turns to the Lord. All right, so uh, I'm going to spell that out now. What is the dividing point in his heart that causes his choices? It is how we view and then treat others. Now, this is incredibly important because, you know, the, the scripture saying Philippians 2 you know, not, don't be trying to have your own way, but give others, esteem others better than yourself. Uh, let this mind be in you. In other words, if there's not his mind formed in us, then we're doing it because we've been taught that that's, you know, th this is how the lamb acts. <laughs> this is how the lamb acts. Well, yeah, it, it might be the same thing, but it's to him. He may see a goat doing that. He may see motives. He may see, and that's why it is how we view and then treat others. And here's what I, I felt like the Lord was saying to me when I wrote that. Do we see the least as lower than us and not worthy of our time and special care? All right. Now, that's to to see that is a certain kind of mind. Okay, Adam has a certain kind of mind. Jesus has a certain kind of mind. Okay. If we see them, what what were the exact words here? Do we see the least as lower than us and not worthy of our time and special care? This mind of Adam will look at somebody out here and I don't even know how to put them worse than a square, but, <laughs> but they will look at somebody out here and with that mind, they categorize people and react or relate or don't relate based on you know, selfishness, uh, uh, trying to climb a ladder and you're no good for that. Uh, I, don't, I can't even tell you all the things, but it sees a certain way. But the mind of Christ sees 
completely different. So let me just draw this person over here. I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> All right. So they see this person, and the mind of Christ sees that person. In Adam, that mind sees that and evaluates that based on life down here, based on self. Has, self is the center of it. Based on, uh, well, I don't really you know, want to get mess, mixed up with that kind of stuff or whatever. But we would think that the mind of Christ does just the opposite of that, and it doesn't. We would say... Oh, you know, I, you know, I'm going to be nice to this person. I'm going to show respect to them. I'm going to, and that's not the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ sees the least as the greatest. It's completely different. It's not some sort of uh, patronizing or, you know, I don't know. You can you can get all built up in your spirit over helping people and think you, that you're something, and that this is the highest. No, that is not the highest. Christ is the highest. And if it's not Him, then it's just a reversal of the mind of Adam in the order of the way it thinks. Just say instead of it doing this, He would do that. But it's not that. He honors the least and Jesus got as low and low and low as he possibly could and God exalted that spirit all right so I'll give you more explanations here in a second but that has to be understood that he doesn't see the same way and he doesn't see, it's not like a mirror image where he sees the opposite either it's not see he's got he's full of eyes and we're full of two we're full of two. And we do not, I mean, uh, he, see, he doesn't just put on glasses and become four eyes. He's full of eyes. And the way that he sees is he sees if our motive is reversing this and trying to be better and nice. And, and do you believe that, that there are Christians as well as philanthropic people that have reversed that and said, oh, well, we're going to give them respect and da-da-da-da. But it wasn't Jesus. See? And so, now, so why am I saying all that? Because the law can force us to try to fit into categories. But when we stand before the Lamb, he sees right through all of that, the best and the worst. He sees right through it. He's looking for something that reflects his nature. And he doesn't care if it's a cold glass of water or a walk with someone who, you know, or it, it's, it's not the, those things. It is, he's dividing the sheep from the goats. And if it's, Sheep, then it's after his kind. And if it's goats, it's not. And there could be a big argument. Well, wait a minute. I did more than that person. All they did was give a cold glass of water. You go, yeah, but they did it in my spirit. And you, with all that you did, did it in another spirit. And then another person step up and say, well, I gave a glass of water too. You know what I mean? I mean, this thing can go on and on. So why am I not put over here with the sheep? Because you're a goat. Well, who says? Me, God. <laughs> I know, and you don't. All right, so, so let's build on that a little bit now. <clears throat> Or do we see the least as that which is most precious in his heart? Do we think that could be Jesus? Because <laughs> it's least. See, we're not, we're, we're walking right past the manger, the barn, and we don't, you know, 
we're not looking for Jesus. We're not. We're looking for poor people. <laughs> you know? And I think there's a different reaction, don't you? Between being somebody who's not poor and doing pretty well and stooping to help. Stooping, see? Stooping. Jesus didn't stoop. He got lower than everybody. <laughs> stooping to help them. Rather than that person really looks the least. That might be Jesus in there. That actually could be Jesus. Our minds don't think that way. We're looking for Jesus, all right. We're looking for somebody who, when they preach or when they share Jesus, their eyes shine and their cheeks get rosy. And, you know, we go, oh, I saw Jesus in them. You know? You sure you didn't just see hot flashes or something? <laughs> I don't know what that is. You know, but that, don't call that Jesus. It may not be that. And, and, and the person that you see that's glowing in their eyes, I see Jesus in their eyes, do they get the same look when they talk about ice cream? Their favorite ice cream. You know. Oh, and I just, you go, oh my God, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus loves ice cream. <laughs> Wrong conclusion. <laughs> <clears throat> that there is... There is a way that seemeth right. There is a place where you begin to conform to the lamb that you recognize the lamb. And you, you can take him out of familiar situations and put him in unfamiliar situations and still recognize him. Still recognize him. Because you know how he operates. He didn't exalt himself. I mean, it, it clearly says that in Hebrews about being a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He, he did not exalt himself. He wouldn't do it. God said, I make you forever a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He swore by an oath. Well, it's big stuff to the Lord. He exalts that spirit, he exalts Christ. He exalts Christ at the cross and who gave himself and exalts him. Doesn't just raise him from the dead. He exalts him above every name. That is name, whether in heaven and earth or under the earth. But he, he exalts that son. Now, he may not exalt it in the earth, you know, because Jesus wasn't exalted in the earth. You think about it, Jesus, when you mention the lamb in the earth, Jesus is still, or Jesus, he's still derided by millions. But in heaven, he's exalted. See? So that means when he is da seen down here, he's not trying to be exalted. Does that make sense? He, down here, he's not trying to be exalted. He's trying to, to manifest the things that touch God's heart the most, and that is that spirit and that nature and that way and that mind. But whether that's then, 2,000 years ago, or in you now, there will come a time that exaltation will come, but it won't come in the earth in the sense that we think. Because his exaltation is also resurrection. That meant you got pretty low because there's no resurrection without death. <laughs> Selfless giving. That's, that's all I'm really referring to. All right. So do we think that could be Jesus? Jesus sees them as him. Jesus sees the least as him. At least the way he, he words this. Listen to this. Jesus sees them as him. Verily I say unto you, and as much as you've done it unto one of these least my, uh, of my brethren, you have done it unto me. He says, when you act that way, you're doing that unto me. 
When you do it in that spirit, you're doing it unto me. You say, no, no. You know, and like they said, I mean, they didn't get it. Well, when did we do that to you? When you have that spirit, and it's not a uh, deprecating or looking down or thinking you're, you know, you can do stuff in a, in a really good way and somewhere deep inside still think you're better than people. I think we all know that. <laughs> That's no big revelation. <laughs> We've all done it. Um, but, but the Spirit of God won't let us up. He's not going to let us drift to the law or any other means. He is always going to pull us back. And so, he, so even with me, he takes us one of the most simple scriptures around. And instead of just showing me the lamb there, he shows me what that doesn't mean, which is any sort of conniving in my mind that I would try to fulfill that apart from the Lamb. You know? I mean, I, I, that, that needs to be slapped out of me first. I mean, you know what I'm saying. But I mean, that needs to, you know, I need to be stood up. I need to be wakened up to a, a see, uh, something that, deals with your heart that draws you back to the Lamb. You know, we drift, we drift, draw back to the Lamb. We drift, we see things in our own eyes, our own two eyes, and we assume we're okay. Then he draws us back to the Lamb, and we go, oh man, he sees it way different than I saw that. And he does it over and over until one day we go, this is it. This Lamb is it. This is the one that he sat on the throne and said this forever and ever will be the central figure and central reality of all that you call heaven. <laughs> I thought it was Gates of Pearl Street to call would be the central. That's what I was hoping for. No more tears, you know, just. It's funny in the book of Revelation how he talks about no more tears and it's usually after you've gone through all this stuff. For him, because of his nature in you. Yeah. You've gone through all of these tears, yeah. all of these sorrows and all this pain, and you're doing it not because you're a Christian or because you're doing it because of his nature that you get lower and you get treated lower and you refuse to raise yourself up because that's not his spirit. So, so you stay with him. But there's still sorrow. There's still, you know... Nobody likes to be disliked, especially by a lot of people. But we certainly, we don't, most of us don't like it at all, even if there's one person. I know, I, well, here's the way I used to be. I mean, this is the truth. This is the way I used to be. I remember one time I was going through it, and I went to the Lord, and I kind of sounded like some of the prophets and people crying out, but I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, Everybody is against me. Everybody hates me. And I was just crying out like that. And he said, no, they don't. <laughs> he said, you have a lot of people around you that are standing with you. And you only have a few that are doing that. And I went, well, it feels like everybody is against me. He said, well, they're not. Yeah, but, you know, it does. It feels like, and we get myopic, and then we get it all narrowed in, and it does. And then you think that way, and then you think, well, you know, da-da-da-da. And it's, it's not that way, because we have two eyes. We don't, we don't have the eyes of the Lamb yet. And yet, that's where we're heading, is to be able to see with his eyes instead of our own. See? We're not going to ever be filled with eyes we're going to have to be his body, and the eyes are going to have to be in him, you know, as it were, through him seeing the way that he sees. <clears throat> and so, um, let's see, let me see where it was here. Yeah, where Jesus said, if you've done this to the least, and you've done it by the right spirit and the right view that I value the least. 
See, that's why the, that confuse, that scripture confuses us over in, uh, what is it, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, where it says, more abundant honor is given to who? Those who lack and the weak indeed. We go, why are they getting it? I mean, have you ever thought that? I mean, come on. I mean, we would go, oh, slackers, why are they getting more abundant honor? We're, you know, I've been working hard and, you know, and he doesn't see it that way. That's what he honors right there. And we have to have that heart or we're not going to honor it. And if it's, and if it's, uh, if it is Jesus and we recognize it and we honor it, that's one thing. But if we can't recognize, in other words, we can't just be that way and recognize that he honors that which is low, that which is least. And that if we do that in the same spirit that we're just if, as if it were Jesus, then he says, you've done this unto me. You've done it unto me because you have taken my side. You've taken my part. You have joined with my view. You have, you have chosen lamb eyes over goat's eyes. You've chosen my mind to be in you rather than the uppity, learned goat mind. <laughs> you know. He is delighted over one cup of water that's given in this selfless loving spirit. To him, it is greater than many great deeds done to gain notice, honor, and respect. All right, um, let's jump. I don't know if we're ever going to jump subjects because it always is going to come back to the land, but let's jump stories. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 15. And you'll be glad to know we're not going to talk about the prodigal son. Luke 15, we'll start with verse 3. And he spoke this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine righteous persons who need no repentance. <clears throat> All right. First thing to note is that this is talking about a sheep. <laughs> Okay, and what have we been talking about? <laughs> We've been talking about the dividing of sheep and, sheep and goats. Um, the second thing to notice is that he is returned. He is returned, okay? And then the next thing to notice is he calls him a sinner, but he was, this sheep was in the flock. And he's come back. So his definition here of repentance and sinners is going to be more in line with what has been said in other places in the New Testament as well as um, what the prophets prophesied, such as Isaiah 53. You remember Isaiah 53? Uh, and then quoted in Romans and in different places. All we like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way. Okay, so our common uh, definition of that is that, in fact, what we tend to say is sinners, people who are not in the family, never were in the family, they, they need to repent and come to Jesus. Okay. 
But in Israel, Israel was an agricultural nation. They primarily were shepherds. You just go right on through the Old Testament and you find Moses and David and Joseph and all of them had something to do with sheep at one time or another. Or their fathers also. And so sheep were raised because it was not only an agricultural nation, but they were dedicated to offering unto God. And the primary offerings that they offering were, were lambs and sheep and what have you. And those sheep, the, the shepherd or the, can I put it like this? The, the, the purpose of the pastor, because the word shepherd and pastor are the same word. The purpose of the pastor was to raise them to such a place where they would one day be ready for the altar. I mean, it was. <laughs> that was the majority. I mean, you look at just like the day they uh, they uh, um, uh, consecrated the temple, Solomon's temple. On that day, I forget the number. I really need to figure it out. But it was like a hundred thousand sheep. You know, it was just a, it was incredible number. And you're going, you just wiped out most of the flocks. You know, but um, but there was this understanding within the shepherds it wasn't you know I like sheep I was I was telling somebody the other day I said you know Israel didn't look at sheep as like this is our mascot or this is our favorite animal they didn't they didn't look at sheep in general that way what was important was slain sheep. See, um, you know, and I, I know we go to Ireland. It's full of full of sheep, all fields of sheep, and all this stuff. And I know that we are bound to take pictures because it's a huge part of Ireland's culture and everything. But there's not a sheep in there that God would go, well, I really like that. Am I right? I mean, think about it. You know, you don't see David hugging sheep, you know, and going, oh, you know. And I, I've been given pictures of Jesus, you know, holding sheep, you know, and, you know, I, I don't know where that one is. <clears throat> and they, they gave it to me because I think they felt that I was a, a really good shepherd pastor. And they wanted, you know, and the, I think... The, the sheep's face was supposed to show their heart. This sheep had long eyelashes <laughs> and looked like he was in love. And I'm going, you know, that Jesus didn't walk around going, I just, I love you. You're just cute. You know, <laughs> you know, he's going, you're slated for death, slated for death, slated for death, slated for death, slated for death. And, and he himself is that lamb, see? And he knew why he came to the earth was to die and to give himself, to give himself, to be a willing offering. And so, so when you had, when, when um, like in Isaiah 53, when he says, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've each one gone to his own way, check the context of Isaiah 53 where that's at. I mean, think about Isaiah 53 right now, where he talks about I was, I was rejected and hated of men, and da 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 da. And I, when they slapped me, I opened or accused me and judged me. I opened not my mouth, and all of those things. And but then it says, but all we like sheep have gone astray. We have left the altar. We have left even the concept of the altar. We have embraced an idea of a shepherd and sheep and that his sole purpose exists to make us happy and full and tender and tell our and fluffy <laughs> until a ripe old age when when we lay down and close our eyes and our sheep spirit goes up to be with the great sheep spirit in the sky 
Um, that's not it. That's not it. It is not, it's nowhere found in scripture. You say, well, what about the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. Well, I don't have enough time to deal with that, but I can show you right there too. Um, you say, what? I don't know if you can. Yeah, I can. <laughs> anyway, um, and so there, so we glorify that and then we think, okay, but if I've gone astray, I've just left Jesus. Or maybe I've even left the Christian way. Or I've, I don't, you know, I don't know. But where those script, that, that scriptures are quoted in the New Testament and where it's meant, originally mentioned in Isaiah 53, it is totally a picture of here is the Lamb of God and what he has done and here's us. And we have left that opportunity, that spirit, that selfless giving. And we're content for him to die for us. See, if it was just about him dying for us alone, then he wouldn't say, all oh, we like sheep have gone astray. He'd just say, he'd say, well, but, but he died for you and it's all good. But he did die for us. But that wasn't the end of it. He wants us, he wants to gather those after his kind in the end, in the, we say in the judgment, but it's not a judgment. The only judgment is the lamb. The lamb is the judgment. The one on the throne isn't making the judgments. He is the judgment. If you're not of his kind, you're judged already. There's no judgment. It's just like, get over here. Does that make sense? I mean, he, he's, he literally is the judgment. He doesn't have to go, well, you know, it's, and it's plain for everyone to see what lines up with his spirit and with his nature. And the spirit and nature that he has is Isaiah 53. See, that's, the, that's the judgment right there is that we are trying to frolic in the field with the shepherd <laughs> and not Finding the purpose for which we exist as sheep in his pastures. And coming to be with him so that in that day, there is no judgment on the sheep. You know what I mean? Enter into my joy. There's no judgment on them. It's just maybe even a revelation. You say, well, how... How do you say that? Don't you believe, and I'm just, don't you believe that there's, I'm just use this, some, there's some little old lady in the closet, prayer closet, and she's, she's growing in the Lord, and she's learning Jesus. Maybe she doesn't know all of our terminology. Maybe she doesn't know all the angles of the cross and all the depth of this and that, but she knows Jesus and she knows, she knows his spirit and she knows his heart and she's drawn to him and that she loves that Jesus and everything. And isn't it possible, because you, maybe you didn't catch that when we read it at first, there is this, this uh, uh, gathering and there are goats and there are sheep and then Jesus talks to them. And he says, when I was sick, da 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 da. This is, the, this is the judgment. The judgment in that case is you goats had no clue. You thought it was don't kill and don't steal and, and be big in ministry and all this stuff. And he says, you, your spirit was totally off from me. You're, you're judged because there's no lining up here with me. And that little old lady would say, when did I do that? When did I do that? He'd say, that spirit was in you, and you did it even to the least of these my brethren. Even, because you, you know, that selfless nature does it for the least to the greatest. He, you know, that's, that one verse says it, that he lets his rain fall upon the just and the unjust. He, it's just him. But it's trying to identify at this judgment that this is specific to this. 
This is a marker whether you're a sheep or a goat. And it has that mind in it. It's not, again, it's not just philanthropic. It's, it has this mind of Christ. It, it says, you know, I honor the least because that could be Jesus. And sure enough, Jesus goes, well, you did it unto me. That's, what it, that's the way I see it. Come in or in with me. So let me read this and then we'll be done. Um, why does Jesus make such a big deal out of one, one lost sheep? I mean, anybody ever wonder that? Why are you leaving the 99? For God's sake, there's wolf packs. And they could come, you come back, and they're slaughtered all over the place. And you know, I got one. I mean, am I the only one that has weird views of stuff? <laughs> Why does Jesus make such a big deal out of one lost sheep? Remember, lost is lost to the purpose for which it exists. Why God allowed it to exist. This is a sheep in Israel. Okay? Be because not the others, but this one had been turned from the altar. The others were fine. It was this one that had been turned from the altar, but is now back in the purpose of God. How he loves this selfless nature. How he loves it to see them back in that spirit. He rejoices over it. It thrills him. He will go any distance to gain it. Isn't that cool? He will go any distance to gain, to bring that back to that spirit. Heaven rejoices with the joy that brings him joy. The angels may not understand it, but they understand that makes him happy. And they rejoice. He is not worried about the other sheep. They have already made the decision to follow the shepherd lamb. He does not have to worry about declension and murmuring from them because he left off giving attention to them because they, re they retain settled selflessness. You know? Well, I mean, don't you think it'd be possible, not in his situation, but it, in a situation where, well, you know, Shepherd, you went off and you're doing this and you're, you're just, just one person and stuff like that and we were left all alone and then the wolf could have killed us and, you know, and you're supposed to go um, lay down your life, <laughs> you know? I mean, look at Jesus on the cross. The wolf came and got him, if you will. The great red dragon came and got him. The beast came and got him. And it, it says that. It says that uh, over and over again in the book of Revelation, like in the two witnesses, and, 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 the, and they, they, the witnesses bear testimony, and the word testimony is martyr. Them. They preach the cross. That's the very same word. And they preach that, and so then this... Beast rises out of the, the, I can't even remember which one, the earth. And it says he overcame them. Well, let's see, what was it? He, he made war with them. He overcame them and he killed them. And that's not the only place. In fact, just today, I just did a quick search in the book of Revelation on, on war, the nature of war. And it was incredible. The war in the book of Revelation. And guess what? Just about every time we lose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's good. It's really, really good. Um, They have already made the decision to follow the shepherd lamb. They're not worried about their lives. 
They love not their lives unto the death. They're not upset because I was uncovered. You're never uncovered. You, th you may think you are, but you're never uncovered if you are called according, lo you love him and are called according to his purpose. Then it's all working for your good or his good and our good that we be conformed to the image of Christ. There is no uncovering in that. There is no uncovering. There is only the plan of God and it will all work toward that end. We don't have to dictate it. We don't have to, well, if this had to happen, you know, who's that sound like? Yeah, Martha and Mary. If, if you had have been here, and all you did with that was cause Jesus to cry, break his heart. Anyway, all right, let's, hey, good time. Let's take a break.